So our next speaker is Camille Dunnigan. We, like a lot of us had to work from home and a lot of us had to change jobs and do all kinds of things. But I never thought like acting was one of the jobs where you could work from home with, um, but you can, right? And uh, we're going to hear from Camille now, who's going to tell us about Emperor 101. Hi, Camille. Hi, Rob. Thanks so much for this. I'm very excited to be able to share this. It's been lovely looking back over the project because it's been uh, a work in progress since 2019, actually. So um, nice to kind of share the history of it. So mm. I'm going to share my screen here. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so as Rob mentioned, my name is Camille Donegan. I'm a virtual reality producer and I'm here today to talk about Emperor 101, which is a live virtual reality theatre show that I produced and did not act in. But yes, my background is acting and uh, theatre production. But for the last uh, eight years, I've been working as a virtual reality producer since I uh, got hooked at a conference. Um, I'll talk a bit about that piece of work that hooked me uh, shortly. Um, but I've been very interested in the concept of embodiment and embodied perspectives. And that has brought me into a whole realm of various sectors, including creating embodied uh, live action, uh, immersive films and videos, as you can see from the picture on the left there. Um, that's actually a piece for FPD Insurance, where you embody the expert. Um, and we just recently created a piece uh, with the partner training company I work with Adaptus Training and we will put you into the perspective of a waiter who has to work through a training methodology to deal with a difficult customer and um, so those immersive kind of videos it's similar to a role play which I would have done a lot of role play as a corporate actor back in the day and um, also took the embodiment concept into computer generated environments with with the DALA project um, which was ne necessary during COVID because uh, we weren't necessarily able to film in 360 and be, be on site and be on location. So this was co-created with uh, service users at CAMS, the Children Adolescent Me Mental Health Services in Galway and Roscommon. Um, and the DALA project goes through a series of uh, scenarios um, around anxiety and helps people who, uh, teenagers who suffer with anxiety to overcome that through uh, positive self-talk and breathing techniques that are brought to life. Um, and it's a very experiential piece. Happy to talk more about that with anybody who might be interested. You can follow up with me after. Um, I produced a virtual reality piece called Out of the Ordinary with Irish National Opera, which was part of the European project. And it's coming soon to a county near you. It's going to be on tour this summer. And that was directed by Joe Mangum from the Performance Corporation, um, who is um, the director of the piece I'll be sharing tonight. Um, I'm also creative director at Solus Viewer, which is a virtual reality meditation app available on App Lab. Um, and I currently work two days as head of production for Cooperative Innovations in Leeds, who are a really amazing um, cutting edge, uh, Unreal optimization, Quest 2 experts. Um, they've been working in games for 25 years and they, they uh, create a lot of immersive experiences. So we're going to be launching our Anne Frank house very soon um, with them. OK, so just a little bit about why virtual reality can be so powerful. Um, so I worked as an actor and theatre producer for many years, parallel to a very boring career in tech in the bank, writing uh, software. And um, I went to the Science Gallery eight years ago um, and went to a piece called Doghouse, which the image you can see on the left. So there was a, a physical theatre set. There were these dinner tables. There was a piece called uh, Doghouse by Mads Dambo. And I was asked which character I wanted to be. This was mind blowing in and of itself. So I chose the character of the father um, and with four other people, we went into headsets and we were all um, in a forced perspective, passive experience in an Oculus DK2 headset. Um, I was in the perspective of the father and through nonverbal communication, I knew that my character was annoyed with his wife. And I knew that that was I knew that he was because every time she took like a glug of wine, he sighed really heavily and I was in that sigh. Spatial audio was amazing. The footage was uh, filmed on GoPro cameras that were put on the actor's head. So the footage was not great. I had a lot of lag, a lot of latency, but I was completely transported. Um, and so intuitively, I felt uh, the power of this medium 
um, and went on to kind of really dive deep and, and became quite obsessed and still am um, with the medium and the possibilities of it, particularly around immersion. And um, so really being transported somebody else into somebody else's body and um, into somebody else's perspective, their way of thinking, their way of feeling. Um, which ties in with empathy. And uh, I'd agree with what Elaine Howie said earlier, this is uh, not by default an empathy making machine. Uh, absolutely not, but it has uh, power and capacity to literally put you into somebody else's shoes and, and I'm interested in exploring those possibilities. Um, depth is, is what the neuroscientists believe is the, is the reason that this is so impactful on our sensory perception set system. So the only dimension where we've had 360 3D-ness is this reality, the reality we're in right now. So our brain, if you're in an immersive experience, particularly, um, I believe particularly with live action because it's the closest simulation to the real world that we can get, um, your brain is, is constantly checking, is this real? It seems real, it looks real, I have depth and I have uh, 3D-ness and I can move, move around um, and that's very, very powerful and um, it's very human. It's a very intimate um, medium. So we worked with an actress last week for that um, restaurant and hospitality uh, training piece that I just mentioned with Adaptus. And um, the, the style of acting required is super intimate. Like you have to absolutely believe that the camera is the character that you're talking to as the actor. So it's quite a, a new style of acting. Um, and then related to that, we really need to get it all in one take. Um, I never want to have edits in, in 360 videos when it's an immersive video. So we like to uh, work with theatre actors that can be really authentic and uh, offer that intimacy and that intimate performance. Um, user experience is everything in VR because you're in the screen. You don't need to draw people into the screen anymore. So there's a whole set of user experience uh, principles um, to mitigate against motion sickness, for example, um, but a, a lot of principles to give people comfort uh, while, they're in, while they're in the experience. Scale is a really fun um, uh, consideration when you are working with VR and something we played with uh, in Emperor 101, which we found very powerful and so did our audiences. So I'll talk a bit more about that later. And um, embodiment I've mentioned, spatial audio is just key <laughs> because you uh, without spatial audio you really don't particularly feel immersed the audio should reflect your position in space and multiplicity is another nice feature of this medium that we did play with in um, in emperor 101 as well so on to the show um so emperor 101 i'm going to read out uh, to, uh the we had a script like a a theater script for the emperor 101 show um, and it came about Tom Swift wrote the piece after several workshops with the creative team. And I uh, just introduce the creative team. So as I mentioned, the Performance Corporation are the, um, the company behind the piece. It was created by Liam Butler, Joe Mangan, Peter Power and Tom Swift was the writer. And um, Peter Power is the sound engineer um, and a composer and Liam Butler was the designer. Um, Katrina Niverku and Carl Quinn were an amazing cast. Uh, Joe Mangan is the director and the script was written by Tom Swift. And I'll talk a bit more about Retinize uh, shortly. So uh, I'm gonna read out the, the premise of the piece as written by Tom Swift. Um, I'm not as articulate with uh, words as he is. Uh, so I'm gonna read out what he, what he wrote because it's beautiful. Emperor 101 explores the world of conspiracy theories and cons conspiracy theorists. For its premiere, it was performed both in real life and in a live interactive VR world. The dramatic action centers on C, a high profile conspiracy theorist whose extreme propaganda has led to her being banned from conventional media platforms and who has resorted to building a virtual reality space to induct recruits to her organization. Emperor 101 immerses the audience in an alternate world that reflects the mind and motivations of a conspiracy theorist. In a time when the very notion of truth or facts is called into question, the use of VR reflects the multiple realities or bubbles we live in. The piece riffs on influences from ancient mythology to Alice in Wonderland and asks if rejection of the mainstream is a product of fear or the ultimate act of self-empowerment in a complex world. Fast forward to... 
to show you this first. Okay, so we were going to be performing the piece. Uh, it was going to be a live and multimedia piece in the digital hub. And we had this abandoned space, which had previously been used for refugees um, uh, as, as a kind of uh, as a space that ended up being used for six or seven years uh, for people seeking refuge here in Ireland. Um, and when we came upon the, the warehouse space, opposite the digital hub premises, uh, it was completely abandoned and in quite a state of disrepair. And um, so that was the inspiration for the environments because we thought we were going to be creating a, a physical theatre show that would have virtual reality as part of, you know, as part of that, so a hybrid kind of format. Um, and what ended up happening is that space was deemed not fit for purpose, as in um, it wasn't safe, it didn't pass the, the necessary risk assessment, so we couldn't hold the physical show there. Um, and we were guided to a space across the road, which had these glass cases, which turned out to be kind of perfect because shortly after COVID hit. So we ended up having a show where the actors performed in these um, in these glass cases and the audience was completely separated from them in the main space. So I just want to kind of introduce that before I step into um, the platform. So what we, we uh, when COVID had hit, we knew um, or we pivoted, I suppose, to use a tech term um, to creating a fully virtual show. We knew that we still wanted some live aspects, but uh, the, the, we were absolutely going to need to lean into the possibilities that virtual reality presented. So we took the concepts, the workshops, everything that I uh, mentioned about the premise that we had around conspiracy theorists and going into the mind of a conspiracy theorist, the protagonist C, going into her mind and going into her world where she indoctrinates the audience. Um, and we thought, well, how are we going to create this? So we talked a lot and we investigated a lot of different platforms. And um, the previous year, myself and Joe had produced a, uh, a kind of a hub in Car for Carlo Arts Festival in Old Space. Um, and that world was built by Kira Del Grasso Bates. And that was very successful. So, so we started off by looking at Old Space and wondering if that would be fit for purpose. Um, but straight away, we, we knew from working with Kira that it was very limited and um, you know the the size of assets that you can bring into old space was very limited and well, fundamentally we didn't know if it would be around in six months time and uh, you know that's a, a valid concern when you're working with a third party platform in this very nascent industry so we um, kind of thought about it looked at very various options various platforms we also looked uh, quite deeply at Engage and well kind of a long story short we decided to go with the the people we knew and trusted so I'd been working for quite a while with Retinize and Belfast and I've been working with their Animotive platform which is launching very soon um, and bizarrely Animotive is, is meant for multi-camera three uh, sorry multi-camera 2D output um, and it's a virtual production platform for animation um, so the concept for Animotive is I'm an actor, I'm playing Lady Macbeth, and another actor is playing Macbeth. We dive into the Lady Macbeth and Macbeth avatars. We uh, are in this uh, spatial 360 uh, Unity built platform. And we're also in there with a load of crew that we can't see because they're invisible. Um, and the, the crew set up multiple 2D cameras around around the space and then action is called and myself and Macbeth you know uh, we we do the scene and uh, then we hear cut stop and the the three 2d cameras um, export is clicked and basically straight to your inbox you get these three um, 2d video 1080p files that you can then create like web series from so it saves 70 to 80 percent animation time it's quite amazing it's very um fluid for an actor to you know embody the avatar and uh, to kind of create the scene very similar to theater except you happen to be in an avatar so it's quite powerful um and i'd worked with that platform so i knew the capabilities and i knew that i could get a really lovely like 360 output from it so we talked with Retinize and what was great was on their technical roadmap, they wanted and needed to be seen to have a Quest 2 
build um, or APK is, is the, the file type. So we worked with them um, to be the platform host um, to create a Quest 2 APK package that would go on to headsets for the audience and the actors um, in this place. And it, it was that was the start of a six month development cycle. And when we get to questions, I'm, I'm very happy to kind of dig in more to the technical um, steps around that. Um, but with working with Retinize, we were able to create bespoke environments, characters and interactivity. Um, we were able to iterate on the design and the development process. As I mentioned, we, we knew each other. Also, Jo Mangan had worked with Retinize on a 360 video previously, so she um, had a shorthand with them and uh, updates to, to for uh, most, of, most of the time were within our control. Uh, I will give a caveat to that a bit later. And just the, the team there are just the most amazing guys, really, to be honest. So Jack Morrow and his team uh, supported us and held our hand. And we had technical issues uh, with, with our live show, uh, which I'll also share a bit about later. So we really needed their handholding. Um, I'm going to kind of fly through these original design concepts to get to where we got to. And I guess the purpose of showing you this is, um, well, I believe from the work that I've made is people coming from other mediums can have maybe unrealistic expectations about the capabilities and the possibilities of aesthetics in these platforms. Um, I now work a lot with the Unreal game engine. This was all built on Unity, you know. Unity is is not as beautiful as Unreal. Um, a lot of that's down to lighting um, and rendering. And, and so you do get a, a stronger aesthetic with Unreal, um, but Unity is, is kind of leaner and in a way cleaner and it's great for interactivity. So there's, there's benefits to both platforms, but we were, we were tied to Unity. And to be honest, none of us knew how far we could push the Quest 2. The Quest 2 was very new, I'm talking uh, 2021 here, yeah, October 2021. So it was literally only out a few months, um, and we we didn't know how many polygons we could get away with. So we were pushing, um, because not only were we building environments and having uh, multiple actors in those environments, we were also having multiple audiences in in um, in the platform. So it was a real unknown. You can do the the kind of maths, and we had or you know, Jack from Retinize had done the math, so we had an idea that we could have up to 50 audience in the platform, but you know, we, we, uh, we really didn't know until we pushed it. And I think in retrospect, we could have had a stronger aesthetic. We could have um, had more pixels basically to play with, but uh, we erred on the side of caution. So you'll, you'll see it's a very, um, get to the video, you'll see that it's a very uh, simple aesthetic. Um, so, this was the conceptual design inspired by the original space where we were going to have the show. Um, it had this really kind of atmospheric corridor. Um, it was a very atmospheric space in general um, because of the different uses that it had, had over the years. Um, and, and this first space was where you would meet the character C. We talked a lot about Alice in Wonderland and fantasy versus reality. So this idea of perhaps C might be able to uh, to grow um, and shrink was something we were interested in exploring. And uh, also multiplicity to have many, uh, many of the avatar kind of surrounding you and the intimidation that could come from that. Um, the second space we wanted to look at was uh, a space where you got looked at, uh, so an observation space where you really felt like you were being um, manipulated and uh, you were being followed and you were being surveyed and tying in with themes around surveillance in our modern, modern world and setting up a, a feeling of paranoia for the users. Um, and the next space, Jo had this really kind of strong idea that she she really wanted to bring to life and we somewhat realized it um but she would have liked the the whole world to kind of twist and shift and shape and because we were working in a live context to have the environment dynamically change would have been very risky um, and and possibly the app would have crashed at those points so again we had to kind of pare back some of the concepts um, and see how else they could be met um, and then we wanted to explore uh, where or how and where conspiracy theorists kind of find these ideas or what fracture kind of happens in, in their mind and 
we had uh, this fictional tale of um, our character C. Her backstory is that she had a, you know, she was in quotes fairly normal until uh, she was in a traumatic car accident uh, with her husband, and he he died. And in the piece, she has a, a monologue where you discover you know this twist that happened in the tale where she believed that he was murdered and he'd been you know and this trauma had actually triggered her to go down these rabbit holes and find a community of people who wanted extreme change and uh, were believing in some some quite strange theories so that was the concept and i want to show you some of the reality so this is uh now as Elaine also mentioned earlier, it never looks never looks great. And this is the headset capture, so it's super low res, but I'm, I'm sure you all kind of know the limitations there. Of a headset he capture. invented it. Freedom. Total freedom. Do the research. Join the dots. Follow the thread. They invent Sorry, so that is um, where you spawn into this kind of large pin room. And uh, then you head on into what's the comes in, multiplies, in C grow. See? Audience follow. I'll talk over it rather than listening to my voice. Shh, curious. And um, so you go from that first room, where which is uh, pins and this kind of real conspiracy theorist audio uh, on all the pins, and you're told to kind of follow the threads and follow the story. Then you come into this surveillance space, um, and these are programmed to to actually follow you around as they move, which is very intimidating and strange. Um, then you go down the yellow corridor, so that was built. Um, and there's there's a music that hits you here, and C is um, bringing you into her her mind, really. And uh, this is where there's this uh, very dramatic monologue where we hear about the car crash and the black eyes that were in the car coming towards you, and um, you're being told that you must go and find this murderer. And then the last room is uh, what we referred to as the car crash room. Um, and in here you had agency to move the car parts around. Um, it wasn't networked actually, again, because the concern over processing overhead. So they are uh, uh, single, uh, single user. Interactivity. So just a couple of other things I wanted to touch upon. Uh, we have, we're still at a point where facilitation and handholding with these experiences is so, so important. So a large part of what I was doing on the show um, um, for, the, for our tour is training in the facilitator. So we have an induction piece at the beginning. When the audience come in, they go into a headset, they learn how to teleport around the space. And that was very interesting in itself because sometimes people really freaked out. Um, I'm thinking roughly about one in 20 people uh, could not stay in the headset. Uh, they felt claustrophobic, um, you know, bordering on panic attacks. It's really, really not for some people. Um, so on the spot, we came up with a hybrid format where I would be the conduit for their experience. I went into the headset. The show was directed at me, but we were casting to a large TV and that person's name was being used throughout um, the shows designed to be one audience at a time. And it's very much targeted at that one person and onboarding them into this uh, organization that C runs and is recruiting for. Um, and that worked out really well. And I love that because that's the spirit of theater is like the show must go on. You're not going to tell somebody you don't like being in a headset. See, you know, uh, they paid their ticket price and you want them to come on in. So touring, uh, here's some of the possibilities of, of live VR tours. Where do these things happen? We brought it to South by Southwest. We'd love to be bringing it to Tribeca uh, and Venice Biennale. London Film Festival Expanded is another place where you can catch this kind of work. 
and there is a real appetite for it. Um, so we launched the Dublin Theatre Festival that had a top and tail live piece. Then we were invited to showcase at South by Southwest with the UK House due to the relationship with Rep Nice, um, which went really, really well. But the actors were uh, actually one was in Canary Islands, Katrina was on holidays and we were um, we were over there at South by running the show and putting headsets on people's heads. But the, the actors were remote. Um, and the show has just been on uh, for a Vancouver festival called LP360. Um, and again, none of us traveled. Actually, Joe was the only person on the ground uh, really kind of overseeing the onboarding and the induction piece. Um, so it just really, it's quite fascinating, this new format of, of theatre and the possibilities that it presents. The revenue model is not proven. Uh, but we're trying. Um, so the, the ticket price for the Vancouver show was 15 to 25 dollars. You know, uh, 126 people paid that to come to the live show. So there was a, yeah, uh, 14 by nine uh, participants live. And then there was a total of uh, three performances remote uh, supported from here, from, from Ireland. And they, they uh, yeah, so people are willing to pay for this. And there's a, an audience there. Um, the carbon footprint's really interesting. Obviously, there's less of us traveling. The, the set doesn't travel, all the logistics that comes with that. So it's uh, really interesting from a sustainability perspective. Um, and then scalability, like we could have this show on with multiple casts in multiple places all the time, um, which is very interesting in different time zones. And, you know, you've got your backstage team supporting. So the possibilities are pretty immense. And just some key takeaways, keep the design simple. We still are working with really, um, you know, it's a phone on people's faces. So uh, we can't overload it or, you know, until we get to better optimization. But you know, I, have to, I have to see how it runs on the Quest Pro, actually. Um, and then the first iteration, we very much had like a narrative piece um, where the audience you, were, were at a play, but they didn't want to be passive. They wanted to... Um, have agency so um, the the next performances were allowing the audience to have a much more interactive kind of so a balance between improvised dialogue and narrative um, we were still iterating right up until launch in Dublin Theatre Festival and we, we did hit issues um, with audio and it turned out to be the, the bandwidth on site so that was uh, frustrating so but you don't don't want to be iterating on opening night uh, with the tech and having new builds uh, support is absolutely key we were just blessed to recognize their amazing team um, and yeah we had a really interesting one with led lights that uh, affected the tracking on the headsets um, so uh, red and green lights are a, a no-go uh, in these environments so that was interesting and there's loads of weird finds like that uh, and rehearsing in VR so Katrina Niverku when she first started working in the headset had never been in a headset before and she got really bad motion sickness so we had to ease her in really gently and I, I was concerned she wasn't going to be able to perform the piece at all and um, but fair, fair play to her <laughs> she did find her sea legs and uh She's uh, well, she can be in there for for hours now, but we have to kind of really uh, up the time very slowly and incrementally for her rehearsals and at, uh, Katrina and Carl were just absolute superstars. You know, you have to be kind of be a techie or you become a techie actor and they were so willing to flex and to adapt and they were really curious about the tech and um, we were just so lucky to, to have those guys on board. And um, so that I think I was just going to mention, open, but I think that's Asha. So I'll stop sharing, Rob, and see if there's any questions. <clears throat> Thanks, Camille. That was amazing. You're really, it's really groundbreaking. Um, you're kind of discovering all the pitfalls for us already and for other people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you just made me think of, <laughs> you just made me think of the next next generation who are growing up on Fortnite and are they going to sit down and watch a movie or a documentary or something or will they want to be in it and they'll want to be interacting with us what's your yeah I think it's um because like I have two stepkids they're they're 16 and 11 and they love VR and they're my my best testers um mm -hmm. but they absolutely love sitting down and watching a movie and and not interacting as well and I think I think a lot of us can relate to that there are times when we 
we want a passive experience so we want to just be consumed by a story and we want to die you know dive into a world but not be a participant um and and then it, so for me they're two quite separate things and and they're um lighting up very different parts of your brain as well um so i think there's a place for both and just the, the last question is, is interesting what you're saying about audio as well sometimes you know we're very visual creatures but um the audio plays a massive part in it as well Mm, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, without spatial audio, as I mentioned, like you, you really don't get that sense of being there to the same extent. Um, so, so to have that power and something, you know, I'm always kind of iterating on it is the that sense of embodiment. So that the the training piece I mentioned that I'm working on. So we're working with the audio team to to have the your voice sound like it's coming from you as much as possible. So, you know, even adding in like a dulling effect that you have when when you're hearing um, through your skull. So um, so I think it's really fascinating to replicate the um, the embodiment sensation, I guess, for, with audio as well.